Many people say poker is all luck. Others say it's a game of skill. Where is the truth and is it possible to win at poker in the long run? We're going to find out in today's lecture about variance and bankroll management. Let's talk about variance and bankroll management. Easily one of the most underrated things in all of poker. Variance and bankroll management is not a sexy topic, right? And the truth is that most of the advice you find online are just rules of thumb. They're just kind of guesstimates. But there does exist mathematically optimal strategies for growing your bankroll as fast as possible. I'm going to present some of those strategies to you today. Now, this is kind of a touchy topic. People have different risk profiles, but I think it's important to manage risk, not just in poker, but in the shots you take, in what stakes you play, and how fast you want to move up. These are key to your long-term poker success. Poker is a game of small edges, and managing risk is key to success. Not only that, but understanding the nature of variance, being able to conceptualize how swingy this game is, will help you control and manage tilt. So I truly believe that variance of bankroll management are one of the most important yet underrated topics in poker. I really wanted to put this lecture out there so that everyone will have some free resources to optimize their bankroll management. We're going to talk about three key topics in this lecture. One is going to be, is poker luck or skill? We're going to talk about understanding variance, and that's going to involve, you know, what is variance? How do you use a poker variance calculator? Uh, how to understand risk of ruin profiles? And lastly, we're going to look at how to optimize bankroll management. Let's start with this question. Is poker luck or skill? Well, you're poker players, right? If it was all luck, why would you even be playing? Just go play slots, right? Buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> so the truth is that it's both. It's not 100% skill. It's not 100% luck. Poker is luck and skill. And how much luck or skill it is depends on your timeline, depends on how many hands you play. It depends on the sample size. Now, when we look at it from the point of your timeline, tiny edges get magnified in the long run. What does that mean? Let's say you have some small edge against your competition. In the short term, your results will be mostly dominated by luck. In the long term, your results are more dominated by skill. And over an infinite timeline, an infinite number of hands played, poker becomes 100% skill. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this works in Chapter 2. Now poker is a combination of both, and the truth is you need to ride out the variance. And learning to do that correctly, learning to only risk what your bankroll can manage is key, right? And this isn't the only thing like that. Other examples include trading stocks or options, investing in a business, counting cards at blackjack. Almost every financial pursuit involves some combination of luck and skill. So thinking in black and white that it's one or the other is, of course, a fallacy. Uh, it all comes down to your timeline. So let's talk about understanding variance. Now, some key concepts for this section. What is variance? What is the law of large numbers? How do we use a poker variance calculator? And what on earth is a confidence interval? Now, these are all very mathematical sounding words, and we've got some fancy looking graphs here. But the truth is that variance is a pretty straightforward topic when you really think about it. When we ask ourselves, what is variance? We get this scary looking graph with numbers and sigmas. The term variance refers mathematically to a statistical measurement of the spread between numbers in a data set. So how spread apart are your numbers? More specifically, variance measures how far each number in the set is from the mean. So if you're getting really swingy results, that's high variance. If you're, most of your results are clumped towards the middle, that's lower variance. In poker, variance simply refers to how swingy your results are. Again, we're talking about how far away your results are from the average. So if we could imagine that there is some true win rate here, someone with high variance would experience extreme swings, where someone with low variance would have their results closer to their true win rate. 
Now, why is this important? Because the swingier your results, the more you need to account for things like risk of ruin, you need to be taking on uh, less risk proportional to your bankroll. So let's try and visualize this. This is just a clip taken from my favorite poker variance calculator, Prime Dope. This is a low variance. This is 50 big blinds per hundred with a win rate of five BB per hundred. And let's compare that to high variance. Now, maybe it doesn't stick out to you, but I want you to pay attention to the axis on the left and right. In this one here, given 20 samples, the best result was like 22,000 and the worst result was like negative 17,000. Previously, the best result was about 10,000 and the worst result was about minus 1,000. So we go from minus one to plus 10 to minus 17 to plus uh, almost 20. So you can see that despite both of these players having the same win rate, one is experiencing much higher variance than the other. Their results are more swingy. Maybe they're a bit of a maniac. Maybe you can see yourself a little bit in this. Are you the, the nitty type who only bets with an edge? Are you more of the big risk taker type? Both results have the same expected value in the long run, but the higher variance approach carries some other risk to it, right? So let's talk about the law of large numbers before we dive into that data a bit more. And this is like the simplest exercise that I think many people do not understand. Most of you will have heard of the gambler's fallacy. I'm sure you guys being even participating in this lecture will have heard of this and will know about it, but you may not apply it properly when it comes to your bankroll. So let's say we flip a fair coin and it lands on heads six times in a row. What is the probability that it lands on heads in the next flip? The truth is, yes, the expected value is that heads retains at six point lead, but it doesn't matter because your probability is 50% to the next flip. Let's take a look. Let's give heads a six point lead and flip the coin a thousand times. The expected value in this case is going to be heads 503 times and tails 497. So the EV starting with a six point lead is that heads retains a six point lead, but it still converges to 50-50. You can imagine if we do it 10,000 times, now it's 50.03 and 49 point, uh, you know, it just gets closer and closer to 50-50, despite the fact that tails never actually catches up from that six point lead. Now, of course it can catch up. Of course, anything can happen, but the expected value doesn't actually change. Now, what does this mean when we think about, for example, if you've taken, if you've hit some run bat, right? You're down, your all-in EV is down maybe, I don't know, 10 buy-ins from where it should be, right? Do the poker gods therefore owe you that 10 buy-ins back? Are you now due for a 10 buy-in upswing? The answer is no. <laughs> right? The answer is no. If you are starting with a 10 buy in downswing relative to where you should be, the expected value is to keep going with that 10 buy in downswing, but over the long term, it won't matter because over a large enough timeline and enough hands, you're going to converge closer and closer, despite the fact that there is no universal karma that's going to catch you up. So let's talk a little bit about risk profile. How much risk can you handle? Now, us being poker players, we naturally, this demographic has a high risk tolerance. Uh, I mean, why else are you playing poker, right? Poker naturally attracts people with a high risk tolerance. But the truth is that the optimal amount of risk for you depends on your lifestyle. Is poker your only source of income? Do you have other income streams? Can you afford to bust? Is it important to grow as fast as possible or make a reliable profit and pay your bills, right? So the truth is that the amount of risk you can take depends on your situation. There is no one size fits all. Despite that, I'm going to show you some mathematically optimal bankroll strategies that try and help you maximize your risk reward. We've talked a little bit about how much risk can you handle. What I want to show you next is one of the most important topics I can show you here, and that is how to use a poker variance calculator. So if you learn nothing from this lecture, learn how to use this tool, okay? This one is by Prime Dope. Others exist. This is a free tool you can find online that helps you find your variance. So this is the way it works. 
we have four fields we plug in here. One is the win rate. So let's plug in, for example, you win five big blinds per hundred. The next is your observed win rate. Let's just leave that blank for now. The next is your standard deviation. Now in cash games, six max cash games, it's about a hundred, but it depends where you play, right? Uh, if you play PLO, it's going to be much higher. If you play heads up, this is going to be much higher. If you play full ring, it's going to be much lower. So your standard deviation in big lines per hundred is something you can find uh, with any HUD. It's a stat you can pull if you don't know, but you can use a hundred as a default thing here. So let's go ahead and calculate that. So we win five big blinds per hundred and we play a hundred thousand hands. Here we see 20 samples. That is to say just 20 random samples given this edge. And we can see that some of the samples ran like a God and others ran terribly, right? And if we look at the variance in numbers, we can ask ourselves, what is the expected value? We typed it in five big blinds per hundred, standard deviation, number of hands, expected winning after 10, after 100,000 hands is 5,000 big blinds. Standard deviation is how much, give or take, you should win. So it's $5,000 plus or minus this amount in one standard deviation. And this is a great tool because it helps you visualize uh, what you should expect to win. So here we can see a 70% confidence interval. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about confidence intervals later, but essentially, if we assume your true win rate is five big blinds per hundred, then over the course of a hundred thousand hands, you should expect to win somewhere between 1,800 big blinds to 8,100. And if you want an even more certain interval, that is to say, we are 95% sure our results will land between these two numbers. That's what you'll get, right? So a really confident interval is gonna be a wider spread, but most of the time, your results are going to be somewhere in the middle here, right? Somewhere close to the expected value. Now, of course, we can increase the standard deviation. So if we put that up to 200, we're going to see it's much more spread out. And if we put that down to 50, we're going to see it's much closer together, closer to the mean, right? So a lot of players ask, what is a good sample size? How do I know if I'm a winning player? Well, this is the tool you need to do it with, right? Let's imagine that you play... 10,000 hands, right? What are the chances that you lose money despite being a winning player after 10,000 hands? If we scroll down here, we can see the probability of a loss after 10K hands is about 30%, right? About a 30% chance that you're going to lose money despite being a winning player, playing a winning strategy after 10K hands, just due to pure luck. However, if we put that up to even more hands, let's make that 50K. The chance that you lose money goes down even further after 50K, right? After 100K, it's down to only 5%. And the sum, this might sound crazy. Like you're telling me there's a 5.7% chance I lose money despite being a solid winner after 100,000 hands. And yes, yes, there is. There's also an equally likely chance that you run like a god, right? So let's say, for example, that you're true when you are a break-even player and you want to ask yourself, what are the chances that I'm actually a crusher who's supposed to be winning at 10 big blinds per hundred? Actually, we'll do this the other way. We're going to go 10 and zero. So and let's do 10,000 hands. So you observe your win rate is zero and you think your actual win rate is 10. What are the chances that you are a 10 big blind per hundred crusher despite being a break even player after 10K hands? And here again, we can see this and we can see probability of running at or above observed win rate over 10K hands with a true win rate of this much. So there's a 15% chance that you, a break-even player, are actually a 10 big blind per hundred crusher after 10,000 hands. After 100,000 hands, it gets even smaller. So after 100,000 hands, if you're break-even and you think you're a 10 big blind per hundred winner, well, that might be true less than 1% of the time, uh, but for the most part, no. 
<laughs> so this is a really useful tool to visualize variance in poker. And as we can see, poker is very swingy. There's uh, variance is larger than your mind can imagine, right? There's also a thing here that has to do with downswings. So that is to say, what kind of downswings can you expect? And the truth is that every poker player, uh, if you play for a long enough timeline, you will experience ungodly downswings and also run like a god, yeah, equally probable, right? Uh, and you need to be prepared for that. Now, there is a human axis that this chart does not simulate. And that is that when players are running badly, they tend to change their strategy. They tend to increase their variance and they tend to magnify their own losses. That is to say, when you're running like crap, you tend to change your strategy to run even worse and take on even more risk. It's just a natural human response. And it's really important to control that response if you ever want to achieve long-term success. Imagine you're running well, you're running well, you're running well, and then you go on like a 2600 big blind downswing, right? You're, you're going to be devastated naturally. Like, how am I running this badly compared to EV? Uh, but if you don't grind through that properly, if you don't continue to play a solid game, then this loss can be magnitudes, orders of magnitude larger than it appears here, because you're going to change your strategy to play much worse. So controlling tilt in times of hardship is also key to managing your risk. Confidence intervals are key to understanding statistics and any measurement where the measurement is uncertain, right? So this is a distribution. This is just a normal distribution. So we can say that Imagine that your win rate is somewhere from left to right. I don't worry about the exact axis here. We're going to say that within one standard deviation, that is to say one standard deviation, i.e. two thirds of the time, your actual results will fall within this range, given that this is your true win rate. So if your true win rate is here, the mean, your actual results within one standard deviation will fall somewhere between here and here. Within two standard deviations, it falls between here and here. So two standard deviations mean 95% of the time, your true results will fall within this range, given that this is your actual win rate, right? You can never be certain what your true win rate is. All you can do is assign a confidence interval and say, I am 95% confident. My win rate is between here and here, and this is the mean. That is the way you express certainty mathematically and correctly. So you can never be certain, but you can play more and more hands until this confidence interval shrinks and you get more and more confidence that your mean here is the true result. That's a confusing concept to many if you haven't studied math or statistics, but it's easier than it sounds. So for example, let's have one here. We observe a true, we observe a win rate of 2.5 big blinds per 100. We play 100,000 hands. What that actually means is that our true win rate within one standard deviation, within 70% confidence, is going to be between negative 0.66 big blinds per 100 and 5.66. If we want to be more confident, if we want to assign a two sigma confidence interval, your true win rate is between minus 3.8 and 8.82. And as you play more and more hands, that confidence interval will shrink down until you get more and more confident results relative to your actual results. So understanding and thinking in confidence intervals is key to determining, you know, am I running bad? Am I unlucky or just bad? Or am I running? Am I a god or just, you know, super lucky? So realistically, if you want to understand the way luck and skill interact, you need to learn how to use confidence intervals and poker variance calculators. And hopefully I've given you guys the tools to get started estimating your results using these types of tools. I'm going to go on here because there's a number of other cool subjects I want to show you guys before this lecture ends. So this one will be quick. How to use a risk of ruin calculator. This one is a very old school calculator based on some old uh, 2 plus 2 Mason Malmuth math. Uh, so let's assign some win rates and some standard deviation. 
And let's say that we are playing with one bankroll. It can never be refilled, topped up. You just play with this edge and this much money until you either win or lose. So we'll assign ourselves a 5% risk of ruin. And that means that there's a 5% chance that we go bust. In order to achieve that, we need our bankroll to be about 3,000 big blinds, right? So about 30 buy-ins. Uh, and that's going to give you a 5% chance of losing all of your money. This assumes there's no moving up and down. It's a very simple calculator, right? Now, let's assume that you are willing to take on a lot more risk. You know, I'm willing to do deal with a 25% chance of busting forever. Well, in that case, you only need about 13, 14 buy-ins, but uh, you better be a winner. You better have this standard deviation because if this is a little higher and this is a little bit lower, well, all of a sudden your risk of ruin just went from 25% to 50%, right? So that's why most people suggest uh, a much larger bankroll. They suggest something like 100, uh, roughly 50 to 100 buy-ins. So here we can see that with a slightly lower win rate and a slightly higher standard deviation, you know, maybe I'll pump that up to 130 this time. You can see that just to have a 5% chance of not going broke, you need an 84 buy-in uh, bankroll, right? Now, I won't get too much into the math here. There are references down below, and I've also built a calculator that will calculate this out for you. But it's important to realize that the amount, uh, how big your bankroll should be, is a function of your win rate and your standard deviation and how much risk you can tolerate. A pro player needs to take on much less risk. Like if this is all the money you have in the world, well, you better be playing stakes that aren't going to bust you. So important to account for your risk of ruin, regardless of whether you're playing cash or tournaments or MTTs or anything else. So let's go on to section two, bank role management. What is bank role management? Why is it important? I'm going to set you guys some very basic guidelines, staking. We're going to talk about fast and slow growth. And finally, we'll end with my favorite subject, optimizing growth with the Kelly criterion. What is poker bankroll management? Well, it's just a term used to describe how you manage the funds available to play poker. Your bankroll determines what stakes and games you can play while limiting your chances of going broke. And again, there's different risk and return profiles. You can take on more risk to the point of being suicidal, you know, buying in for all of your money in the world and then losing it all. Or you can be very conservative and take a very slow growth approach. And the truth is that there is a mathematically optimal curve to how much risk you should take on. And sometimes it's easier said than done. Sometimes it's a little bit softer and not so cut and dry, but I'm going to keep it simple for this presentation. So what is the goal here? The goal ideally is to grow your bankroll as fast as possible without imploding, right? We want the perfect amount of risk to maximize return without completely imploding our bankroll. So what does that look like? Well, too much risk has a very high certainty of busting. And more psychologically, you end up playing scared money, right? You alter your strategy because all of a sudden the utility of the money, uh, that is to say, you know, losing this $200 matters so much to you that you actually change your strategy to something suboptimal. So suboptimal plays are sometimes even required just to preserve your bankroll if you're playing too aggressively, if you're buying in for more than you can handle. So the utility of money comes into play. Conversely, not enough risk, very common, way more common than you might think, uh, involves getting stuck at low stakes forever, paying a ton more rake, putting in, you know, a ton more volume is required to climb out of there and ultimately very little reward for long-term effort. So a lot of people that they want the dream of, you know, building up a bankroll from the micro stakes. I don't recommend that, uh, you know. I don't recommend trying to grind your way up to high stakes from free rolling. That just doesn't work very well in the long term. It's much better to use low stakes to train yourself to play well and then make a real investment at you know low stakes at least. Because the truth is that the amount of rake you pay at the micro stakes is just disgustingly high, just ridiculously high amount of rake. And 
trying to grind your way through that is going to take so much more long-term effort than should be required that oftentimes you'll give up on your poker dreams long before they ever really started. Now, that's a controversial opinion, but there is a good balance between not enough risk and too much risk. There lies the optimal middle ground. You could talk about fast growth versus slow growth. Uh, this is very similar to the last slides of fast growth. Uh, it's riskier, requires less volume, higher risk of ruin, paying less rake, and slow growth is more conservative, requires a lot more volume, lower risk of ruin, and paying more rake. I don't really like to set out exact numbers, uh, but I figured I, I'm kind of required to in this lecture because if I don't, you know, people will say, well, you never told me what to do. But the truth is that I'm not trying to tell you how much, what bankroll strategy you should be using because it depends on your risk profile, right? What I'm trying to do is give you the tools to figure out what stakes you should be playing yourself. So I've set out some very generic guidelines here based on common wisdom. So for cash players, we'd say roughly 35 to 65 buy-ins, somewhere in there, never risking more than 5% of your role. That would be way too much. Uh, and for tournament players, somewhere between 75 to 125 buy-ins, never risking more than 2% of your bankroll on one tournament, unless, of course, you're selling a lot of the action. So somewhere between here is considered very standard rules of thumb bankroll management. So let's talk a little bit about other ways people deal with risk. And one of them is staking, selling action. So another way to manage risk is staking. And this involves selling a portion of the action. The staker takes a share of the risk in exchange for the promise of a piece of your success. And sometimes they'll even, you know, staking also involves giving you some of the money. So staking can be between, you know, individuals, stables, uh, larger institutions, uh, and Believe it or not, this concept of trading risk exists uh, everywhere. Now, I used to work in the insurance industry. And in the insurance industry, believe it or not, most insurers actually pool their risk under what's called reinsurance, which is like a larger insurance company that buys the risk from smaller insurance companies. And so realistically, they're all most of them are just sharing one giant pool of of risk, right? They, they each shell a big portion of their risk to these major umbrella companies that you've never heard of, nameless, faceless mega corporations. And then these guys, they also uh, they also sell their risk to an even larger umbrella that you've never heard of. So in every industry, what they'll do is they'll sell a portion of their risk to the next big guy underneath, and then they'll all pool their risk. And the reason they do this is because uh, with financial institutions specifically, lower variance is better. And in poker, selling a portion of your risk is a way to mitigate the amount of variance that you take on, right? If you buy in for a tournament and you sell a piece of the action, it's a similar way, thing there, right? You're, of course, you get less reward, but also you are, uh, selling some of the risk to other people so that you can afford to play higher stakes. So we'll talk about how to build mathematically optimal bankroll strategies next. And the way this is done is through the Kelly criterion. Now, I have to say that this is a topic that people don't address much because it's difficult to apply the Kelly criterion to poker directly. Some formats are easier than others, uh, but I have an attempt here that I think you guys will like so what is the Kelly criterion? Well, a mathematician found out a formula that tells you what portion of your bankroll you should invest given some edge, uh, some odds on a bet. And it turns out that depending on how much of your bankroll you risk at a time on some repeated bet, you're either going to grow conservatively, aggressively, you can maximize it at some point, but then if you risk too much, it's almost a guaranteed bust, right? Or almost just guaranteed to be negative growth in the long run. So this is that middle ground, the correct amount of risk to take. Now let's talk about where at how much risk you should take. So the classic formula for the Kelly criterion is this thing here, where F is the fraction of your bankroll to bet. Uh, B are the decimal odds, minus one. P is the probability of winning, and Q is the probability of losing. 
So just to give you a rough example, here's a simple one where you play heads up, sit and goes. And these are great because you can directly apply the Kelly criteria onto these. Uh, so you play heads up, sit and goes and average a 5% return on investment. Your bankroll is $1,000. What stakes should you play to grow your bankroll as fast as possible? Give me your best guess. Kelly Criterion has one major thing, and that is for a uh, heads up bet for a one for one bet. You should uh, you should risk your edge. So if you have a five percent edge, you should risk five percent of your bankroll, and the math works out such that five percent of a thousand dollars is a fifty dollar buy. -in. That is the the most aggressive strategy you could take to grow as fast as possible, assuming that this is your edge. And keep in mind that it would always be 5% of whatever your bankroll is. So if your bankroll grew, you would then take 5% of that, right? Now, again, recall this math here. We can simplify this a bit. So in this case, B is one, we're getting one to one. Uh, you know, we're just ignoring rake here, assuming that our 5% includes rake. P is equal to 52.5, Q is equal to 47.5. And if you simplify this out, you get P minus Q is 5%. Risk your edge. If you have a 5% edge, you risk 5% of $1,000. Now, that said, that is what's called a full Kelly strategy. Realistically, you don't usually want to take a full Kelly strategy. This is right here. This is redlining your engine as fast as possible so that you're maximizing growth. But what most investment professionals actually recommend is something like half Kelly or less. And the reason for that is that a half Kelly strategy captures something like 75% of the growth while taking on only 50% of the variance. And so a more sound answer, despite B being the actual correct answer, might be C, $25. Uh, it's not the fastest growth method, but it is, uh, it's going to capture at least 75% of the growth without taking on a ton of risk. So applying the Kelly criterion to cash games is a little bit tricky, but we can somewhat regard it as a coin flip bet for 100 hands. Um, now that's not really reflective of what's going on, but it, it's kind of close enough to get a good estimate. So we can plug in your win rate and your standard deviation into the Kelly criterion formula, solve for P and then use those numbers to figure out how much you should risk. So in this case, uh, your win rate would be, let's say 10 big blinds per hundred. And let's say your standard deviation is 100 big blinds per hundred. You're gonna find that P equals 0 0.55 or 55%, uh, which means you have a 10% edge and you should risk 10% of your roll. Probably less than that because you never really wanna go full Kelly, right? Now, this method is oversimplified, uh, but it's approximate. I've built a calculator here based on some more advanced math that I'm not going to get into in this video that tells you exactly what your bankroll should be given your current win rate at some stake and your potential win rate at the next stake. I'll show you that next. I'll share this spreadsheet with you guys. It's going to be free to access. All you do is just go file, make a copy. I'll post the link in the Discord afterwards and you can make your own copy. The way you use this is simply to fill in the grade boxes. So this one uses some more advanced uh, calculations. You can learn more about this in the mathematics of poker or from this two plus two post, short explanation down here, blah, blah, blah. But let's imagine that you're playing some stakes. So I'm gonna say you're currently playing $100, uh, you know, NL100. And the next stake is NL200. Now let's imagine that you're currently winning for five big blinds per hundred, but you think you'd win uh, four big blinds per hundred at the next stake. Now, if we translate that to uh, dollars per hundred, here we're winning five dollars per hundred, and the next stake would be winning eight big eight dollars per hundred. We can imagine that our standard deviation is about the same at both stakes, uh, the same in big blinds per hundred, but not the same in dollars per hundred. It's actually double at the next stake because you're risking twice as much. 
Now this formula, again, taken from the mathematics of poker, page 301, tells you what the critical bankroll is before you should move up to the next stake. And in this exact case, it's $5,000. So you should have, you should be taking shots at the next stake once your bankroll is greater than $5,000, right? Now, the way this works is by using the Kelly criterion to say how much money you'd need before it's worth it to take on extra risk and extra variance to move on to the next stake. Now, I clearly do not have time to reference all the math here, but I've put links in there for those who are curious. If you don't care, all you really need to do is type in your win rates here and figure out exactly how much money you'd need. Now, there are certain cases, for example, uh, let's say that you're currently doing quite well here and maybe poorly here, right? There is, and this is a real thing that happens that people don't realize is that you might actually be making more at a lower stake or at your current stake than you would moving up, right? Like in this case, you'd actually be losing money and doubling your variance moving to the next stake. It's just not worth it. But what if it's really close? What if it's like you're making $5 per hundred here and six per here? Well, now all of a sudden you need a much bigger bankroll to justify moving to the next stake, right? Here's the next question. How much should you invest at the next stake? Should you take big shots or small shots? And the math actually shows that small shots are way, way, way more efficient than big shots. That is to say, you know, just taking like a three buy and five buy and shot at the next stake is going to be way more efficient than, you know, taking huge shots and then having to grind it all back up afterwards. That is assuming that you have, a, you know, a higher dollar per hundred at the next stake, right? And the, the math behind that is based on risk of ruin for how much you're putting in for your next shot. And of course, the Kelly criterion for how much you're risking at the next stake. And you can see more about that in this post here that I've referenced. Ideally, when you use this, you would want to say, for example, like, let's give ourselves something more reasonable. Let's say we expect to make even more money. So $8 per hundred at the next stake. If this is the case, you need at least $5,000. That's 50 buy-ins at your current stake. And you would build up a little bit beyond here. And then you would only risk that and move back down once you hit 5,000, right? So maybe build up to like, I don't know, 5,600, take a three buy-in shot, and then move back down if you fail, rinse and repeat. Anyway, the long and short of it is smaller shots are more efficient than bigger shots. And you need to calculate your dollars per hundred, not your big blinds per hundred, but your dollars per hundred at the next stake to see if it's worth it. The other thing is you should be overestimating your variance and underestimating your win rate because every poker player overestimates their win rate and underestimates their variance. So make sure to run your numbers a bit more conservatively than you poker players might otherwise. This is just the risk of ruin calculator. You actually saw this earlier. Uh, I posted a link. I just made it myself using the same math here. So again, this is just based on like some mathematics. You could say, here's your current stake. Uh, I think this one's in big blinds rather than buy-ins. So 100 NL, five big blind win rate, standard deviation, we'll say like 20 and you want a 4% risk of ruin. There's a few different ways to calculate it, but here's the bankroll you should be using given these numbers. So again, there's a website for this, but I, I built it anyway. Uh, heads up, sit and go. The easiest to calculate, this is a uh, very direct Kelly criterion calculation. Again, you plug in your ROI. I, I, this could also work for spins, by the way, right? Like if you have a 1% spins here and like, a, I don't know, like a $3,000 bankroll and you want to take maybe a half Kelly approach, so we'll put in 0.5. So here you just enter a number between zero and one, one being the most aggressive then you should be buying in for like $15 heads up, sit and goes, right? MTTs are more complex. I put some links here for you guys. I didn't really have time to build an MTT calculator. 
you can roughly, roughly approximate it using this if you know your ROI on tournaments, but it's not a one for one bet, right? MTTs are like maybe like a 5% chance of winning a huge amount of money and a 95% chance of winning very little money. So it's not really directly applicable. I put a post here that you can check out if you want a more optimized MTT approach. Perhaps I'll write more about that later. I didn't really have time for this lecture though. I've also put some links here for you guys. I highly recommend you check out this video. Would you take this bet by Veritasium? Love Veritasium. Uh, it's basically the Kelly criterion, except you know it's done by Veritasium, so it's it's much better than my video. <laughs> uh, Mathematics of Poker, great book. I always reference this when I'm doing something math related. Uh, here's some two plus two posts for MTTs and more for cash as well. So further links if you guys want to go down the rabbit hole. In summary, understanding variance is absolutely required for long-term poker success. Poker is a game of small edges, right? And every serious poker player should be required to learn how to use a poker variance calculator. Controlling risk is key to success. There's an optimal line between conservative and aggressive risk. And just as you risk your hands and your holdings and your bet sizings in an actual poker game, you need to manage your risk as effectively when it comes to your bankroll and what you're buying into. If you have any questions about it, feel free to follow up in the Discord. Thank you all for your attendance today and happy grinding.